Hello everybody, my name is Kara and today I'm here with my September wrap-up. Also today we are in front of my combination crafting and theater shelf, so enjoy the change of scenery. The first book I finished in September was The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. This is a very character focused science fiction. We follow uh, several main characters but Rosemary is kind of the main point of view and she has just joined the crew of a particular ship and she's sort of like the new hire so she is getting to know the crew members and getting to know the ship and we follow them on a lot of little stops or like jobs that they do along the way. They are being hired to do a job that is much bigger and more dangerous than any they have done before but overall this is really a story about the characters and their relationships and about this world and the different alien species in this world. So starting off this wrap up with a bang with a very unpopular opinion. I didn't like this. I will say right off the bat though I completely understand why so many people love it and I do think it's really great that we have such a warm and happy feeling science fiction and I do think that Becky Chambers had a pretty solid um, grasp on the world and on the different alien races. Um, I think she had that very well thought out and sometimes that came through in the writing, sometimes not, but like the concept and the kind of the background that she had for the world I think were very well developed. I just found this book incredibly boring. Um, I had heard that it was very much not a plot focused book which I thought would be great for me since I am much more about characters but really like nothing happens and that would have been fine if I really loved the cast of characters but I did not. Like I didn't connect to anybody in this book. Um, especially Rosemary who is the one who you're kind of seeing the story through her eyes which was very unfortunate. Actually there's something in this book that's called like fun tea and then like boring tea or something and the whole time I'm reading this I kept thinking I'm like Rosemary is boring tea like why would you have her be like the main point of view character. There were a couple of characters I liked more than others like Kizzy was a lot of fun um, but none of them really got to me. I didn't feel anything for any of them and just as an indication of how completely detached from the story I felt um, there's this one plot line that involves an AI and like wanting to be human or considering if she wants to be human and that is something I love. Like I love that exploration in science fiction. It's one of my favorite things to read about and it did nothing for me. Like I did not care what happened to her. I didn't feel anything for their relationships either. I didn't feel like they were well developed developed or well built up or interesting in any way. There's a few main romantic relationships and two of them you're kind of thrown in at the beginning like knowing who's involved with who and they're both incredibly high stakes in the way that like their lives could be in danger or like their way of life could be in danger if people found out about them. So like there's a lot at stake here and I didn't feel like it. Like I just didn't understand why these two cared about each other enough to even be around each other much less risk their life to be with each other. And then even the world building, um, which I mentioned like that is one of the things I liked about this book, but I don't think like it was always executed well because Becky Chambers has this way of not telling you important information until you've forgotten it matters. I like when there's not an info dump, but I think you still need to have certain things dropped earlier than others and she didn't do that. Like there were at least two or three times where I distinctly remember we learned like an explanation for a particular thing that had been referred to in a really important context earlier in the book and I couldn't remember what it was because I had no like like I didn't know what it meant so I didn't know it was important and then like a hundred pages later she tells you why it's a big deal and I'm like well that would have been great to know when this was first introduced because now I feel like I'm missing a huge piece of the story. I have a really good memory for books and I was still like not picking up on things because of the way she dropped in little chunks of world building. But overall I do really see why people like or love this book but it just really did not work for me and I gave this book two stars. Next I finished Binti the Night Masquerade by Nadia Okorafor. This is the third and final book in the Binti novella trilogy. This novella basically uh, follows Binti after she has returned home after the really dramatic events of the first novella um, and it's kind of her readjusting or kind of reframing her place in her community and her family, um, kind of how that comes into conflict with who she is now and the things that she wants from life. I ended up giving it three stars because it just felt kind of middle of the road to me. I do really like the writing um, I have across all of the novellas and I really like Binti herself and some of the questions of identity and culture and tradition and how those can conflict with your own personal dreams and what you want but how they don't always have to conflict. But ultimately like the overall plot and story of this novella just felt kind of weird. Um, a lot of this book felt extremely anticlimactic and in a way I kind of liked that because it did go against a lot of expectations but it also kind of just felt like why like why are we doing this why did this happen I just feel weird about this last installment I do really recommend the trilogy overall but this was not my favorite next I finished So Silver Bright by Lisa Menchev this is the third and final book in the Theater Illuminata uh, trilogy in the first one it's a theater setting her main character is Bertie Shakespeare Smith and this whole series is about her trying to find her family 
and also about um, like other characters that she meets along the way and especially the fact that she is like she has this kind of power over words and over language and how that kind of works in with this world as well. I know that's a very vague synopsis but honestly it's really hard to explain what the series is about. It's more about like the feeling I think you get from it and the characters and definitely the setting. The plot felt super random and a lot of the scenes just like Felt like we were wasting time for no reason because like they didn't end up mattering. Um, Birdie herself is an incredibly irritating main character for the majority of this book, um, possibly even the whole series. I'm really not happy with how some things were resolved with the love interest characters because there is a love triangle in this series. So basically I had a lot of issues with kind of main aspects of this book but somehow I still kind of liked it. Um, I really just love the way Lisa Manchev writes and this blend she has of whimsy and humor and strangeness and a little bit of darkness sometimes. The way that she can create a place in such few sentences, I just really admire that. And the way that she can craft characters in a very short amount of time too. Like there were a couple in here that were not not incredibly important to the story overall but they were very memorable and I'm glad they were in the book. There were a few scenes in this book that I really loved. Like there's one involving a mirror and traveling through a mirror that I just loved like it really pulled at my heartstrings in a way I wasn't really anticipating and I just think it was beautifully written and just a very powerful scene. I'm gonna talk really quickly about some spoilers for this book. Um, specifically I'm gonna be spoiling the love triangle and who Birdie ends up picking because I feel like that's a big reason why I put this book off for so long because I got spoiled for that and I was angry about it. So if you don't want to know who she ends up with, skip this part. But honestly I'm glad that I knew who she picked because I think I would have liked this book even less if I had been surprised by that. So here we go. Birdie and I just have very different taste in men and that is fine but I truly do not understand why she would ever choose Nate. Like not even like Nate versus Ariel, um, just like Nate as a person. I'm like why like why are you romantically attracted to this man? Like what what is what does he have going for him? He is so annoying. He's so bland. Like the author wrote his dialogue in a way that I think is supposed to sound like a pirate or something but I don't think pirates talk like that. Like I don't think anybody in the history of the world has talked like that because it's, it's not like a regional accent or anything. It's like using words that don't belong there and like weird pronunciations and spellings and it just it was a really frustrating hodgepodge and it made him like it made all of his dialogue so irritating to read. I just really hated Nate and I hated him and Birdie together. I did really like Ariel although I have this vague memory that Ariel did something in the first book that I was really not okay with but I don't remember what that was so take my opinion with a grain of salt but I just found him an incredibly interesting character and so much more I don't know I feel like him and Birdie were so much better suited to each other and in a way I understand why the author ended things the way she did but I'm also really annoyed by it because I really hate when authors like write out one of the points of the love triangle so that the main character doesn't really have to make a decision like I feel like that's kind of cheating and I'm just really mad about what happened to Ariel. I do recommend the series overall, um, especially if you have a very high tolerance for whimsy and if you're kind of prepared for some of the more frustrating aspects like Birdie and the plot nonsense. Like honestly this is a series you just have to go into and like apply the don't worry about it rule. <laughs> so like if you're reading this and you're like why are they suddenly in a magic caravan? It's like don't worry about it. Who are these random side characters? Are they even important to the story? Don't worry about it. That's honestly kind of the mindset you have to have with these books. But if you can, I actually really enjoyed my experience reading it. I can really see myself rereading the first one especially and even uh, the second one and parts of the third one, mainly the aerial parts. Um, but like I had fun with it and I gave it three stars. Next I finished Archangel by Sharon Shin. This is a really interesting genre mashup of like sci-fi, fantasy, paranormal, romance. We follow two main characters. One of them is an angel named Gabriel and in this world the angels are like their marriages are kind of arranged um, at least when they're in a certain high position so they have to marry this person in order to like preserve the safety of their world kind of. It's a little complicated um, but he gets told that his chosen bride is Rachel and for a lot of reasons Rachel is not thrilled about this like Gabriel assumes that she would be um, and so the rest of the book is really about their relationship and then there are also some plot developments that are related to the world and the politics of this world. For the most part I did enjoy it. Um, I really liked the romance and the character development for Gabriel and for Rachel because um, Rachel definitely she's had some really terrible things happen to her so you definitely understand why she is so distrustful, why she doesn't want what Gabriel assumes everybody would want, um, like this position of power. And then from Gabriel's side um, at the beginning he really comes off like very uh, condescending, very like arrogant and sure of himself and you gradually learn that there's more to him than that, that he actually has this incredibly good heart and he is very compassionate and he's just not good at showing that sometimes, which is not to excuse his behavior, but um, like I just feel like the book did a very good job of showing 
like his flaws but how they're not irredeemable um and you are very like invested in these two characters and in how they feel about each other and realizing that they do care about each other and another thing i loved about the romance is like from pretty early on in the book it is stated flat out that like this marriage does not have to be um like consummated or like it doesn't have to be a physical like sexual or romantic thing if the parties do not want it to be like it's more a political uh kind of thing and there have been cases in the past where like the two people in the marriage like didn't really interact with each other at all um and i just really appreciated that because i feel like in a lot of romances that are set up this way there's this like underlying assumption that like well these two people better fall in love quickly because otherwise there's going to be some issues of non-consent um so i was so happy that that wasn't present in this book i enjoyed this story a lot more when it was about rachel and gabriel getting to know each other and the side characters um once we got into the bigger political uh, like implications and the actual like antagonist of the book i started losing interest um, i just don't feel like that part was as well developed as the relationship stuff was and i also feel like the angsty part of the romance dragged out way too long for me um like i love some angst but it got to a point where like it didn't feel believable that they would still be fighting like this and so it just made it like really tiring to read the last part of this book but overall i did still really enjoy this book i gave it 3.75 stars although weirdly i don't know if i'm going to be continuing the series even though i own a lot of the books in the series because they follow um different time periods and settings that i'm not really interested in in this world so i don't know but i'm glad i read this one next i finished the wendy by aaron michelle sky and stephen brown and as you can probably guess this is a peter pan retelling we follow our main character wendy and she wants to be um in the military in this like special magic branch of the military and eventually she does get there but she's still not really allowed to help in the way that she wants to so she's fighting back against a lot of the sexism and assumptions of her time period um and then there's also this like greater magical threat that is represented by peter pan basically in this world england is at war with magic and i really enjoyed this uh this book was interesting because i feel like there's a lot of elements to it that could have been done very badly but i feel like they were all executed really really well um like we have multiple potential love interests which can be very frustrating but in this case i didn't mind it because like wendy is wonderful <laughs> so i kind of understand why people would be like so invested in her like so quickly because like i just thought she was great also the whimsical writing style really worked for me um i think if you don't like that style you might not get on as well as i did with this book but i don't feel like it was it was too like cutesy or anything i feel like that fit in really well with the kind of humor in this book um it's always hard to describe humor in books but i feel like this was a very like tongue-in-cheek and kind of like gentle humor which i really liked and also this is definitely not an action focused book um it's pretty short and it also takes place over a relatively small time span and um I guess plot span. Most of the book is really spent leading up to one of the main events so we don't get that main event but it actually didn't bother me at all because I really enjoyed the journey along the way. Like I loved the characters, I loved the writing, I loved the interactions between these characters and the whole like setting and feeling of this world and of this particular retelling. I'm really excited for the sequel and I gave the Wendy four stars. The next book I read um, I have a lot of things to say about so if you if you'd like to i recommend getting a snack or a hot drink because i'm going to talk about this one for a hot minute and that is the sparrow by mary doria russell this is a first contact story when the civilization is discovered um the first group of people to find out about them and to uh, start an expedition to meet them is a group of jesuits and they go not to evangelize or anything like that but just to meet them and to learn from them and to explore this uh this new planet and this new culture and we know right from the beginning of this book that this uh, expedition was a complete disaster and that everybody except one person, our main character, Father Emilio Santos, um, died. And then the rest of the book is divided between flashbacks leading up to the expedition and then the expedition itself. And then the other part of the book is like many, many years later after everything has gone wrong. And then Emilio's superiors and just like the world in general trying to piece together what actually happened on this mission that led to everybody's deaths and, and Emilio's destruction too in a way because it is clear when he comes back that he has been possibly irreparably damaged physically, mentally, just emotionally. So I had a lot of problems with this book but I'm going to start out with a couple of things that I did like. Um, I think that there were scattered throughout some really profound and beautiful moments like some great explorations of emilio the main character's um perspective and why he does the things he does like some beautiful passages about uh doubt and certainty and responsibility and free will um those i think were explored beautifully and were very powerful and i wish there had been more of that throughout the book like i had kind of been led to believe there would be and other than that like really the only thing i can say i liked was um kind of what it represents like the 
things it was trying to do. Like the concept was very good. I have so many things to say that I actually have to divide this into sections of things I didn't like. Uh, so I'm going to start out with the ones that are more like personal preference or personal experience. Things that I don't think would bother everybody necessarily, but things that I did notice. So with this book, like the summary and the reviews and everything I have ever heard about this novel promised some really deep like philosophical explorations and questions. And for the most part, I really don't feel like I got that. In addition to the author, I think just getting some basic details kind of wrong about the groups she was discussing or portraying. Um, I also just feel like the things she chose to emphasize were really weird and not really what this book was supposed to be about, I thought. So pretty much that whole like philosophical question or exploration basically just turned into like an obsession with celibacy. Like that was it. That was, there was just like this really intense and weird focus on like how all of these other characters felt like that was so wrong or strange or unhealthy or gross or just like stupid and weird. And I just feel like that got a lot. I can see why they would have these very strong feelings about that concept or that idea, but to have the novel itself spend so much time on it just felt really weird and kind of boring and repetitive and just, I don't know, not not like profound, like I was expecting this book to be. And another big problem I had was this book's really intense focus to the exclusion of almost all else. Um, this focus on like the idea or the question of like, why does God let bad things happen? And specifically like the uh, Jesuit priest characters, um, several of them spend a lot of time on that. Like multiple characters in this book just spend an inordinate amount of time on that question. And like, here's the thing, slight philosophical tangent here, but like free will is a very big deal in Catholicism. So I'm not saying that like that question, like that idea of like theodicy never comes up because it does. Like I have known people who are very focused on that. And even though I personally have issues with the way that is phrased, like why does God let, or like why does God cause bad things to happen? I have issues with that, but I know that some people do address it in that way. And of course, as with all religions and belief systems, um, there's going to be a wide variation across members of a particular group. But I feel like the way it was done in this book was very misleading in the sense that it made it feel like this was a common thread throughout Catholicism or that like all Catholic people felt this way. I just feel like it was very misleading and shallow, um, like the way that was explored. But again, this is in the category of like things based on my personal experience and knowledge bothered me. Not sure they would bother all readers, but now moving into the more like objective complaints I have about this book. This book is way, way too long for what it is. This is, is it 500 pages, I think? And it really didn't need to be. And it was exhausting because like I said, you know from the beginning that all of these people die and everything just ended in disaster. And then the book does this like flashback thing and it's like it tries to make you get emotionally attached to these characters and I'm like, listen, I already know they all die in horrible ways. I'm not, like, I'm not gonna get really emotionally attached to them. I'm not gonna do that to myself. And the flashbacks were just so long and so boring. Like the, the leading up to the expedition was like hundreds of pages long. I just didn't care about that part at all. Really the most compelling part of the book, and actually I should have mentioned this earlier because when I talked about things I did like about this book, um, the most compelling part for me by far was the aftermath. And we're trying to piece together like the mystery of what happened and we're seeing characters that are not doomed to die, um, who were very, some of them very interesting. So I really liked those sections and I wish the whole book had been those sections because the flashbacks were just excruciating. As far as the characters go, in addition to just not wanting to emotionally invest myself in them, I just don't feel like a lot of them were well developed. Like we did get to know Emilio pretty well, which makes sense given that he is like the central character and this book is 500 pages. But other than that, I don't feel like the cast was very well developed. There were a few people in the future sections of this book that were likable and that were actually very good people and like you wanted, like it was nice to like root for them, um, but it was it was just very hard to really feel like you got to know any of these characters. And in particular, I have to give a mention to the character of Anne, who is so annoying. And it turns out that the author like based her and her husband on like the author and her husband. And like, I know there's a lot of conflicting opinions on like how self-insert is, like how that should be viewed. 
I don't usually have too much of a problem with it, but it was just like, after learning that, I was like, oh, maybe that's why her dialogue felt so cheesy and so forced and like the author was like clearly trying to give her some like really good lines and it just like didn't work. And speaking of which, uh, the dialogue in this book was awful. It was just so stilted and like cheesy sometimes, but also pretentious and like, I don't know, I had a lot of things wrong with it and just like the writing style overall, um, but especially in the dialogue, like I just, like real people do not talk like this and especially anytime the characters had an exchange that was supposed to be funny or clever, it was painful. There was also a shoehorned in romance subplot that took over way too much of the story, and especially with how that interacted with the novel's fixation on the concept of celibacy, like it just got to be insufferable pretty quickly, like I was just so over that whole plot line. And finally just like this book made me feel sick, like the constant like trauma porn and like suffering and just excruciating detail of these terrible things happening, it just it was sickening and I finished this book and like I actually felt sick to my stomach like I just don't know how to rate this. I originally gave it three stars because there are some things I think this book did well or like questions it asked that were good but the execution was for one thing I don't think very well done but also I just hated every second I spent reading this book and I don't know if like a three star rating really reflects that accurately. So I may drop it down to 2.5 stars later. This book overall just really, really didn't work for me and I kind of wish I had never read it. Next, I finished Desires and Dreams and Powers by Rosamund Hodge. This is a short story collection of this author's short stories. Something I like about all of Rosamund Hodge's short stories is the way that she creates an atmosphere so quickly and like her, her writing is very, I think, evocative and atmospheric and so um, I feel like it pulls you in very quickly, which I think is very important in a short story. I like that even though a lot of her main characters do things that it's like you as the reader know are a bad decision or like they, you know they're a bad move, it's like you can understand why they're doing them. I mean even when her main characters are motivated by something kind of frustrating like the idea of like true love and it's like a character that they barely know, for some reason I buy it and I think that's a combination of just like really liking the way she writes and also the way that she describes the main character's emotions and choices. It's kind of like, okay, well, even if I don't think you're really in love with this person, I understand why you do. I especially love her fairy tale feeling stories more than her speculative fiction or like sci-fi ones. Um, but I think I, I probably rated a couple of those a little too harshly because I knew going in that there were some of my favorite stories in this collection that I just adore with all my heart and soul. And I think I maybe graded some of her other short stories like too harshly based on that. But overall, I gave this collection four stars. Um, if I just wanted to run through a few of my favorites and her eyes sewn shut with unicorn hair, super dark, effed up unicorns, it was really interesting. Um, Ways of Being a Mermaid's Daughter was really good. More Full of Weeping Than You Can Understand, I think that's the title of it. Um, it's like World War One and Fairies, which was very interesting. Uh, Three Girls Who Met Forest Born I really liked. And those are stories that specifically take place in the world of Crimson Bound, one of her full-length novels. So I feel like you do have to have read that for those to really like work for you, but I really enjoyed them. Of the Death of Kings was really good. Cut Her Out and Little Stars is one of my favorites of all time. Like the exploration of sister relationships is just ugh, beautiful. I feel like Rosamund Hodge does a really good job with sister relationships like in general. Good Night Sweet Prince was really good and also A Guide for Young Ladies Entering the Service of the Fairies. Um, that also was a really good one. Next I finished The Girl on the Tower by Catherine Arden. This is the second book in the Winter Night Trilogy and I bet you read this with my friend Huck from Badger Reads. I will of course link her channel down below. So the first book follows our main character Vasya and it's a it's a retelling of the Vasilisa the Beautiful um, fairy tale. I'm trying not to spoil stuff but this book um, it takes place at a different location. It's more plot focused. So Huck and I actually chose buddy read this because neither of us liked the first book but we had heard the second book was better and was like very different from the first one and we also just felt like this is a series we should love like it sounded like something we both would really enjoy so we wanted to give it another chance and I'm really glad I had Huck for moral support because I did not like this. I did feel like the plot of this one was slightly more enjoyable than the first book. I like that we got to see some of Vasya's siblings here. I actually thought they were very interesting characters much more interesting than Vasya herself, and I liked this, the horse named Solove. Solove basically should have been in charge of the whole book because he had a brain and Vasya did not. Um, so as you can probably tell, one of my main issues with this book and with this series is Vasya as a main character. She is just insufferable. She just makes like the stupidest decisions constantly, and like I like when characters you know are fallible and they make mistakes, but it's like every time she is faced with a decision, she does the worst possible thing that she could. And it's like, even when people who know better than her give her good advice, 
she just she does her own thing and i feel like she's this very like flat and generic kind of character as huck actually put it in her wrap up which i will also link um she's a very shallow interpretation of what a strong female character is because she is that very like headstrong won't listen to anyone will do whatever she wants to like for no good reason um and I just didn't feel like I even understood why she wanted the things that she did. She has a few like very shallow personality traits and one of them that we really get beat over the head with in this book is the fact that she wants to travel and she wants to be free and she wants to explore the world and there's never any reasons like given for that. Like I really understand her position of like not wanting to be forced into a convent and not wanting to be forced into marriage. Totally get that. But it's like she has no actual interests or dreams or thoughts to replace those things. Like there are so many reasons why, that the author could have given her for why she does want to see the world, like why she wants to get away from the place where she lived or where she was born. Like there are so many great reasons to explore for that and we're never given any of them. So it just makes her feel like a really flat, shallow character who is like shoved through the story at the whim of the author and makes disastrous decisions the whole time. Putting aside my issues with Vasya for a moment, um, I also feel like just the characters overall didn't really do much for me. I did mention I liked her siblings. They were one of the only things that made this book even slightly bearable for me. I feel like the romance plot was kind of ridiculous because even though I liked the character she's kind of set up with a romance with, I just I do not understand why he likes her, much less loves her or is interested in her. Like I just... Vasya does not have enough personality to fall in love with. So all of the all of that like subplot around her, multiple characters are obsessed with her. Um, all of those subplots were just like unbelievable to me. And on top of that, even though I did like the plot better than book one, it still didn't do a lot for me. Like it felt a lot of it felt pointless. Like we spend like 50 or 60 pages at one point, just like Vasya almost freezing to death in the forest for no reason. And also I feel like this book is weird because it draws on some very specific Russian fairy tales or folklore type things. And if you don't know those already, a lot of this plot is not going to make sense to you, like especially near the end. Um, and luckily I had kind of a like passing familiarity with the material that we needed, but I'm like reading this and I'm like, how, like, if you aren't familiar with that story, how do, how are you going to feel about this the end of this book because like so much of it doesn't make sense and like even knowing where some of the references come from i'm like this still doesn't make that much sense i'm also really pissed off that the disgusting evil priest guy is back i thought we got rid of him in book one but apparently we did not um yeah this this series is just not for me and i gave the girl in the tower two stars next i finished unmarriageable by sonia kamal and the kind of subtitle description of this is pride and prejudice in pakistan and i feel like that's a pretty good um summary of what the story is or at least of the premise of the book um we call our main character alice or elizba it's kind of the uh, original pride and prejudice setup in that she has uh, several sisters and her mother is very very set on marrying them off we have a rude man named valentine darcy and he comes to town and everything kind of goes from there so i ended up really enjoying this um, Sonia Kamal really plays up the contrast between the comedy and the darker elements of the story, um, which I liked actually. I thought that was a very interesting choice. I also think she did a really excellent job of um, translating the original story into a different time period and setting, showing the parallels between um, the current like Pakistani marriage culture um, with the culture of the original Pride and Prejudice. Of course I'm not from that culture so I can't say that definitively but it seems like she did a really good job of like drawing those parallels and kind of reinterpreting the story in that way. I really love how feminist this book was and I really like how it fleshed out some of the side characters that we don't spend a lot of time with in the original novel. Um, I feel like this book gets a special prize because this is the first time I can ever remember really understanding why Charlotte, uh, why Charlotte Lucas does what she does. In this novel her name is actually Sherry. In an intellectual way I can understand but like I can't really ever make myself like feel why she did that if that makes sense like just every cell of my body is repelled by Mr. Collins on like every level so it's really hard for me to like put myself in her position even though she is making a reasonable choice and in this book I feel like Sonia Kamal did an, an amazing job of showing why the way Sherry was treated and how this was something that she would want to escape. I just think that was very um, sensitively and powerfully done. Um, I do have a couple of complaints with this book. Uh, one of them is like I mentioned the fact that the author really plays up the contrast between like the madcap hijinks and humor with the darker elements. Like, I feel like there were some places where that felt jarring. And then other than that, I feel like the characterization of Alice and Darcy, um, I feel like for a while their characters 
or like you're enjoying their characters or understanding them relied a little bit too heavily on you already loving the characters from the original novel. But other than that, I had a lot of fun reading this and I gave Unmarriageable four stars. Next, I finished The Weight of Feathers by Anna Marie McLemore. We follow two families, the Palomas and the Corvos. The Palomas put on like mermaid water shows and the Corvos do high wire kind of tightrope walking. Um, and this is a story about uh, Lace Paloma, um, a girl from that family who, due to all of these circumstances, is kind of forced to kind of unintentionally seek refuge with the Corbos. And it's about the development of a relationship between Lace and Cluck, one of the boys from the Corbo family. And for a while I was apprehensive about reading this one because the whole Starcrest lovers thing is not always something I like, but I should never have doubted Anne Marie McLemore because I loved this. As with all of her books, the writing is gorgeous. Um, the setting and the general atmosphere of the story just felt so rich. Um, I loved Lace and Cluck as main characters. I loved the development of their relationship and how it builds very slowly and how you see them kind of gradually getting to know the other person and realizing that these prejudices they've had about the other family are not true. I just thought that was really beautifully done. And I feel like the magic or the magical realism elements were also just beautifully done as with every novel of Macklemore's that I read. And if I had one complaint with this book, it would be that the ending was a little unsatisfying for me, although I understand why it ended the way it did. And in a way it makes sense. I was just hoping for something a little more or a little different, but I still love this book and I gave it four stars. Next, I finished Through the Evernight by Veronica Rossi. This is the second book in the Under the Never Sky series. I don't actually know what that's called. Um, and it's like a sci-fi dystopian. And Arya is known as a dweller, which means that she lives in these domes that are protected from the harsh environment outside on this planet. And Perry is, I forget what they, what they call his kind, but he is um, basically one of the people who lives out in that environment. And in the first book, we see them kind of traveling together. And this book is really more about their, the further development of their relationship and about um, some secrets that are starting to come to light about the fact that there may be more danger in this world than anybody is aware of. I think it's a pretty solid middle book. Um, I like that there was so much development with the plot and with the characters. Like, I don't feel like this book suffered from middle book syndrome. Despite the fact that the two leads are separated for a good chunk of this book, I didn't mind it. Um, I actually kind of liked that because I feel like we got to really know them more as individuals and like their individual perspectives on their relationship and on the things that were going on in this world. I also really liked some of the side characters and getting to see more of them. Um, there are a couple that Veronica Rossi really surprised me with and I really like that. With all that being said though, I didn't enjoy this book quite as much as the first one. I just found that for me the specific plot threads and the main romantic relationship just were not as compelling to me in the second book. So I ended up giving this book 3.5 stars, but I am really excited to get to the final book. Next, I finished The Jumbies by Tracy Batiste. This is a retelling of a Haitian folktale called The Magic Orange Tree, and this book is set in Trinidad. And we follow our main character, Corinne, as she basically is faced with the knowledge that Jumbies, these um, kind of dark magical creatures that live in the forest that uh, everybody is told these scary stories of and that Corinne has never believed in, she actually realizes that they do in fact exist and that one of them seems to have a special interest in her and her family. I really loved the setting of this book and how richly that was described and I also really liked Corinne as a main character. Um, she was really fun and spunky. Overall though, I didn't really like many of the characters. Um, I feel like we didn't spend a lot of time developing them and the ones that we did I didn't really like. Like she makes friends with three children, um, two of them are brothers, and I just didn't really like either of them as much as I think we were supposed to, which was kind of a bummer because I was really looking forward to the friendships in this book. And I also feel like the plot overall was just kind of disappointing for me. It's hard to explain, but there was just something about the plot that didn't work for me. Maybe it felt too repetitive, or maybe I just wished there had been other plot elements besides like just this single-minded like trying to defeat the Jumbi. This didn't work. Now we're upset and we're afraid everyone's gonna die. Let's try this other thing. Oh, that didn't work either. Everyone's gonna die. Like it just kind of felt like that happened over and over. I ended up giving it 3.5 stars, so I did still enjoy it, but I didn't love it like I was hoping to. Although I do think the like creepy and horror elements, um, like middle grade horror, I think those were done really, really well, actually. Next, I finished We Are the Perfect Girl by Ariel Kaplan. This is a modern day gender swapped retelling of Cyrano de Bergerac, which is one of my favorite plays ever. I just love it so much. In this book, we follow our main character, Aphra, and her best friend is Bethany. Bethany is like very shy, very quiet, and just stunningly beautiful. She's like the most beautiful girl at their school. And Aphra is known for not being as beautiful, but she's incredibly smart and really clever and witty and funny. And there's this boy at their school named Greg D'Agostino, and he's basically like the heartthrob of their school, but he's also just like a really nice and smart person. Like I feel like he really breaks a lot of the stereotypes of 
like the popular crush worthy character you know and bethany is really really interested in him and it turns out that afra has also had a crush on him for a long time but bethany doesn't know this and through a series of circumstances afra basically ends up in the position of having to help her best friend win the affections of the guy that she is also in love with and y'all this book was so good i loved it so much i feel like it's gonna be really difficult to talk in a coherent way about this book because i just loved it so much and it hit me so emotionally i feel like this book did a really good job of handling kind of the ethical implications of what afer is doing you know like deceiving somebody into liking somebody else because i feel like when you're reading a story like this it's really important that as you see the main character make these choices not that you understand them or that you would do the same thing but you have to be at least understanding enough that you can see why they would do what they're doing. I feel like this book did a really good job of showing how like Afra had all of these small-ish decisions that at the time it's like she knew they weren't really right but she didn't think they were that bad and you kind of see why she thinks that and why she ended up doing what she did. I feel like that is so important with a book like this because you still have to like Afra, you still have to want things to turn out okay for her. And speaking of Afra, I just absolutely adored her with all of my heart like she is she is so like funny and warm and flawed and like the way that she can talk herself out of basically anything like you really see how that has affected her um but she has this like incredibly good heart like she is just so selfless to the point that you kind of want to yell at her that like you are also worthy of good things and I just like she's one of my new favorite characters I just love and respect her so much and I just want to be her friend and Bethany too I feel like was developed so well I mean considering that she's not the main character like we don't get her perspective I feel like by the end of the book you really understand what Bethany is going through too and also Greg was just like such a sweetheart I loved him he was like such a good love interest. And speaking of the ethical questions, I feel like it's also really important with stories like this. You have to see that Afra and Greg do have a connection. And there's never like actual cheating or anything. Um like and I don't think this book romanticizes that either. But I feel like it's really it's really important that you see their interactions and feel that spark and like kind of understand why these two characters would be drawn to each other. Because for one thing that also fuels the plot of like it's sort of like a reverse cheating almost because like the whole Cyrano de Bergerac like story is like they fall in love through letters so it's like Greg and Afra are starting to like each other but he thinks it's Bethany so like when him and Afra interact it's actually like not like cheating because they actually have fallen in love with, with each other but they don't actually know it I don't know if any of that made sense but basically I really don't like cheating in, in books and I feel like this book handled that really really well I also really loved the humor and the writing in this book like I just like Afra's voice is just like so wonderful to read and I think this is first person too which like I hate reading first person and I like I didn't hate reading this like I just loved Afra as a character and I loved like the her thought processes and being in her head even though sometimes it is really upsetting because it becomes clear that she is not as confident as she thinks she is and speaking of which there's a really positive portrayal of therapy that i thought was so great and also just like the emotional connection that i felt with this book was just like so strong like i i don't know like there's this one line that just like completely broke my heart because it's it made your heart hurt for a for so much and it also made you think about like it made me think about like being in high school and having some of these same insecurities and like I just I just feel like this is a book that could speak to a lot of people and I'm really sorry because I feel like this is one of my least coherent reviews ever and that makes me sad because I love this book and I would love for other people to love this book but if you can't tell I gave it five stars maybe I need to actually do like a separate review on it so I can try to assemble my thoughts but I loved it. Next I finished The Way You Make Me Feel by Maureen Gu. We follow our main character Clara and after a disastrous prank goes wrong um, she is sentenced to spend the entire summer working at her father's Korean Brazilian food truck. And the worst part from Clara's perspective is that she is also forced to work with her mortal enemy Rose Carver. This book follows them on their punishment over the summer and as the two girls slowly start to get to know each other better and become friends and there's also a romantic subplot with Clara and a boy named Hamlet <laughs> and this book is a lot about food and family. I really liked this. Um, I loved the focus on friendship. I loved uh, Clara and Rose's like interactions like later on and I just really liked the way their friendship developed. Um, I loved the focus on family and the really thoughtful exploration of different kinds of families. Um, I also love the food in this book. The first chunk of this book was not as enjoyable for me to read. I found it actually very frustrating because Clara is introduced as being this very like fun-loving, chaos-loving uh, kind of prankster and like she doesn't think about how any of her actions are going to affect other people and it's just very 
frustrating reading from her perspective even though like that is the point like i understand like that's the point of her of her character it's like seeing how she becomes a more thoughtful person while still retaining that fun living side um so, it's, so i'm not like faulting the book for that necessarily but the part that i did like really not like about that is that it seemed like at the beginning like there was no real reason for her like acting out and doing the things she did and as the book went on i feel like it was developed very thoughtfully and you start to see that there's a reason that it felt so like put on and like performative but also like so the love interest angle i liked hamlet i really did he was sweet and funny and like kind of charming but the number of times that clara referred to him in her head as a labrador was kind of ridiculous to the point where i stopped seeing him as like a viable love interest because i'm just picturing this like giant puppy boy and i just i don't know like i understand what she was going for like he's very like fun loving and exuberant and sweet but i don't know it's not really something that like says love interest to me is like comparing someone to a puppy and also this one is like very much personal preference but this book takes place in la and it really makes sure you know that I am just not a fan of LA and I'm not really a fan of like reading things set in LA. Like I think the setting was very well developed in that sense and some of the references I did really enjoy but on just like a personal enjoyment level it's not a setting that did a lot for me. But I did still have a lot of fun reading this and I gave The Way You Make Me Feel 3.75 stars. Next I read Excellent Women by Barbara Pym and I'm actually not going to talk about this book at all because I read it on audio. I know, who am I? Uh, basically I'm trying to force myself to like audiobooks and I'm gonna do like a separate wrap up because I have I tried a few audiobooks that I'm gonna talk about. Um, so if you are interested in my adventures with that, keep an eye out for that. Next, I finished Hungry Hearts, edited by Elsie Chapman and Caroline Tong Richmond. This is a short story collection, and all of the stories are actually um, kind of interconnected. They all take place in the same area, which is Hungry Heart Row. And all of these stories heavily feature food and culture and relationships and family and like how all of those things interact and I really really enjoyed this. I liked the way that they were connected to each other and I, I think the fact that they did all overlap a little bit like there are some recurring characters or like you you see people at places that you know from other stories and like it all takes place in the same neighborhood. I feel like it made it easier to connect to the stories right away because they already felt kind of familiar um so I think if you have a hard time with short stories you might enjoy this style of collection and we also have like a wide range of cultures represented it was incredibly diverse and I love the way that even though there was so much variety there were also a couple of cultures that were re represented more than once like for example you have two stories that draw on Chinese food and culture and I just really liked that because I feel like that's a really good reminder that like there's not one uh one takeaway or one story like from that perspective or from that culture I feel like that sounds like a very obvious thing but I just think it's nice to have that um have that kind of reminder for people that just because you read a story from a particular perspective it doesn't mean everyone from that background has that perspective or that exact same experience. Rain by Sango Mandana, four stars, that was one of my favorites. Kings and Queens by Elsie Chapman, 3.75 stars, although that one has really stuck with me even though I hadn't originally marked it as one of my favorites. The Grand Ishk Adventure by Sandhya Menon, 3.75 stars. Sugar and Spite by Rin Chepeko, 3.75 stars. Moments to Return by Adi Al Said, four stars. The Slender One by Caroline Tong Richmond, four stars. That's another favorite. Um, Give Me Some Sugar by Jay Coles, five stars. That was definitely one of my favorites and obviously my first five stars in this collection. The Missing Ingredient by Rebecca Roanhorse, three stars. Didn't care for that one so much. Hearts a la carte by Karuna Riazzi, four stars. Bloom by Phoebe North, four stars. That one was really powerful. That's another one that has really stuck with me. A Bountiful Film by SK Ali, four stars. Side Work by Sarah Farizan, five stars. And finally, Panaderia Pastelaria by Anna Marie McLemore, five stars. I apologize for my Spanish pronunciation. Overall, I really enjoyed this collection and I gave it four stars. And last but not least, I finished Classic Beauty, The History of Makeup by Gabriela Hernandez. And shout out to my friend Yvette because she gave me this as a present. And thank you so much, Yvette, because I loved this. This is a nonfiction book about the history of beauty um, through various different time periods and like I said I really really like this. Um, one of my favorite things about it actually that I don't remember other books doing. Um, I've read a lot of nonfiction books about this topic at this point and I don't remember any doing this but I really like the way um, at the beginning of each uh, decade or time period they would have this little like color palette kind of illustration and like a diagram of like where things would be emphasized on the face. I just thought that was a really nice visual representation. There's a lot of great info in here and some really cool like illustrations and of course photographs of like old vintage makeup that were really fun. Um, the only thing I found a little hard about this book is the organization or kind of the general layout. I think all the books I've read like this before they either do a chronological perspective so tracing all kinds of makeup from ancient times up to the modern day 
or they do it by um, like a kind of makeup, like face, eyes, or lips. And then within that, they generally do chronological order. And I feel like this book kind of mixed them up a little bit. Like I couldn't really figure out a clear way that the author was organizing it. And for that reason, it made a couple of things feel a little repetitive because she would kind of go out of order and then circle back to something. Um, but other than that, I really, really enjoyed this and I gave it four stars. Okay, everybody. So those were all of the books I read in September. If you stuck it out this far, uh, thank you so much. I love you. <laughs> I will see you guys soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read. Bye.